A reading from God's Word, Ruth chapter 4. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. And they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the, present of the, in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you, will, if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know For there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to to perpetuate the name of the dead in his presence, in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and to Malon. Also, Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house, like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, in a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid, on, laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to see if I can, I've got glasses, I've got a face mask, I've got a microphone. Can I get this off without doing too much damage? When you live on the missionary field, the mission field, you learn to adapt to your circumstances. It's so good to be here uh, amongst friends, colleagues, and to have the privilege of 
sharing God's word with you this morning. Let's start with prayer. Father, I pray that you would speak through me into each heart that's here or each heart that listens. I know that I am weak, and yet you are strong, and you are here, and you are moving. Make us all aware of that. This morning I ask in Christ's name, amen. We worship a holy, majestic God, our majestic Father in heaven, and yet this God is here. He's here, closer than your breath, much closer than the person sitting in front of you, behind you, or beside you. God is here and he sees you more fully and loves you more profoundly than you or your loved ones can see or love you. He sees, how your, he sees how your life, or he sees all of your life in light of all your particular circumstances, and he sees the legacy of every step of faith that you take and every redemptive act of love, mercy, and grace that you will ever make. And he is working in, through, and around you. As Paul wrote in Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. These truths and more are found in the book named for the Moabite widow, Ruth. There we learn about the blessed offspring of the marriage between providence and perseverance in the loving kindness of God. You remember the story of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite woman who lived in the days of the judges and who married a man from Judah when he and his family were living in Moab. But Ruth's father-in-law died, as did his two sons, including Ruth's husband, Malon, leaving Ruth, her sister-in-law, Orpah, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, to fend for themselves. They were in the middle of a severe famine, and when Naomi heard that the famine wasn't impacting Judah to the extent that it was Moab, she decided they should head there in hopes of finding the means to survive. But soon after heading to Judah, Naomi decided that her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, would be better off if they returned to their Moabite families and sought new husbands and social support in their homeland rather than in Naomi's. Orpah goes back to Moab, but Ruth returns with Naomi to Judah. They arrive in Bethlehem in the land of Judah to find food for herself and Naomi to survive. Ruth goes and gleans in a nearby field. You probably know that gleaning was the practice permitted by Israelite law and custom, whereby the the poor were allowed to help themselves to portions of unharvested parts of fields in order to survive. It turned out that Ruth just happened to glean in the field of a godly and compassionate man named Boaz. And he made sure that she was safe and that she and Naomi had more food than they could ever need. When Ruth told Naomi about their luck, Naomi informed Ruth that it just so happened that Boaz was a relative, someone who qualified to fulfill the role of a kinsman redeemer, a relative who would be expected to repurchase property that an impoverished member of their clan had sold out of economic necessity, restoring that clan's inheritance. The kinsman redeemer was also responsible for standing up for dispossessed relatives and maintaining their rights. So it had just happened not only that Ruth had unknowingly found herself gleaning in the fields of an extraordinarily godly and generous man of means, but this man, Boaz, also just happened to be in a position of social responsibility and qualified to redeem Ruth and Naomi and provide for them all and more that they would need to flourish. Actually, of course, Naomi realized that these things didn't happen. They didn't just happen. 
This was not a matter of luck. When Naomi heard about Boaz, she told Ruth, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. She knew how these things had come about. And you understand that when I speak of things just happening or luck, I knowingly speak to people who know better than that. In a scene filled with intrigue, Naomi just happens to know that Boaz is working down at the threshing floor that evening and will spend the night there sleeping under the stars. She tells Ruth to find where Boaz will sleep and to go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he'll tell you what to do. And Ruth replied, all that you say, I will do. When Boaz wakes up and finds Ruth sleeping at his feet, she informs him that, she's relate, that he is related to her and that he qualifies as a kinsman redeemer and indicates that she wants him to play that role, which would entail purchasing back land that had been owned by Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech, and marrying Ruth. It turns out that Boaz was aware that he qualified to be a kinsman redeemer for Naomi and Ruth, but he also knew that there was a man even more closely related to Naomi and Ruth to whom that responsibility as kinsman redeemer would apply first. But Boaz lets Ruth know that, quote, it, <laughs> no, no, that it just so happened, that's not a quote from the text, believe me, that he would be more than willing to play the role of kinsman redeemer if the more qualified person, the more qualified man refuses to take on that role. And so he goes to find that man. And that's where we pick up the story in Ruth chapter 4, which was read for us. Boaz, who is clearly a highly respected man in Bethlehem, goes to the city gate. And what do you know? But the other redeemer came by while he was there. When Boaz asks him to sit with him, he agrees. When Boaz, Boaz asks 10 of the city elders to sit with them, they immediately do so as well. Boaz explains that Ruth and Naomi needed their kinsman redeemer to purchase some land that had belonged to Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. And when the anonymous redeemer expresses a willingness to do so, Boaz clarifies, as we read in verse 5, quote, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to per perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So it was a package deal. Whoever purchased the land would also be purchasing, redeeming, marrying Ruth herself, and will be expected to, pro to provide for Ruth and Naomi in other ways besides restoring the land to her family. The unnamed redeemer replies, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of re redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So in case you missed it, Ruth just happened to wind up gleaning in the field of a relative who qualified to be her kinsman redeemer, and the more qualified redeemer was not willing to take on that role. But Boaz, it turned out, was eager to take on that role and to be for Ruth and Naomi all that they might have hoped for in a kinsman redeemer. Now, scholars debate whether or why this other kinsman redeemer couldn't redeem the land and Ruth without negative repercussions for his own inheritance. And we don't actually know whether or not Boaz's own inheritance would suffer any negative impact. But for the former, it was a deal breaker. And for the latter, it was a non-issue. Redeemer No Name legally passed his right of redemption to Boaz, and Boaz had the elders and all the other people at the gate confirm that they were witnesses to this legal transaction. Verses 9 and 10 of chapter 4 recount that Boaz told them, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. And they didn't just agree that they were witnesses, 
Rather, they added a blessing, invoking the name of the Lord twice in the process. In verses 11 and 12, we read, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in a a, a a a I said that better before. <clears throat> worthily in Aphathratha, and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. We need to pay attention to the allusions to the other women included in this blessing, that Ruth might become like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel? Wow! Rachel and Leah were the mothers of all the children of Jacob, the mothers of the children of Israel. How could someone like Ruth, a Moabite woman, needing to be redeemed out of her poverty, ever become so important for the future of the people of God and thus for the future of God's plan of redemption, not only for Israel, but for the world? How could that be possible? And the other allusion is to Tamar, another woman who had known terrible difficulties, trials, and obstacles, but who ended up being responsible for establishing the powerful house of Perez, from which Boaz comes. Could Ruth really end up being the mother of such an important family line as that? Well, the rest, as they say, is history. Boaz took Ruth as his wife, and the Lord gave her conception, we read, and she bore a son. You know, if you take out all the biblical theology and replace it with the standard American view of romantic destiny, you might think that you found a movie on the Hallmark Channel. But the theology makes all the difference. Verses 14 through 17 point out that through the offspring of Boaz and Ruth, the Lord had provided a redeemer not only for Ruth and for Naomi, but as Naomi's grandson Obed would continue her line and family as well, and not only had God provided a redeemer for Ruth and Naomi, but Obed was the father of Jesse, the father of David. That might be just David to his great-grandmother Ruth, but that's King David to you and to me. And that King David is the one Paul is talking about in Romans 1 when he speaks of God's son who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ is the one through whom, by whom we were bought with a price, a, a much greater price than Boaz paid for Elimelech's land and for Ruth's hand. And the Gospels of Matthew and Luke remind us that Ruth anticipated another devout maiden, Mary, who bore Jesus. And so Matthew's genealogy includes that royal line, including various female, foreign female members, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Uriah's wife, and he brings that line down to Jesus. The genealogies at the end of the book of Ruth and at the beginning of Matthew and near the beginning of Luke, remind us that God's redemptive providence, as revealed in Ruth's story, is understood to have been at work in every other generation, linking Ruth to King David, and then King David to Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ. God is at work in every generation, showing his mercy, advancing his purposes, moving the story forward towards its ultimate conclusion, the ultimate establishment of the fullness of God's kingdom through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is at work in our generation, in your life, and in mine, if only we have eyes to see and hearts prepared to recognize the traces of his goodness and grace. Through the book of Ruth, as my former professor and mentor Bob Hubbard points out, the author stresses both the hiddenness and continuousness of God's work. 
And Ruth, the Lord doesn't guide human affairs through intermittent miracles now and then followed by long periods of apparent retreat. Rather, his activity is hidden behind or perceived within the actions of the human agents. Yet he's presumed to be the implicit, imminent, and ultimate cause of events. Hence, the Lord turns out to be the cause of even the smallest so-called accidental details of life. In Ruth, divine providence resolves the three common human needs which hang over the story of Ruth like a dark, foreboding sky. Issues of food, marriage, and children. Naomi and Ruth live difficult lives, and this book does not reflect the view of someone wearing rose-colored glasses. It recognizes the pain and suffering experienced by all people, some more than others, including the people of God. We know there are people who suffer issues relating to food and marriage and children that do not have the resolution that Naomi and Ruth have. Not everyone has what would be described as a happy ending, but God is recognized to be working in and through his people to bring to completion his plan of redemption, of global and eternal reach. In various parts of Ruth, Ruth may come across as a passive follower of directions given by others. Boaz told her where to glean, and so she gleaned there. Boaz said, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine, and so she did that. No, Naomi told Ruth to wash and anoint herself, put on her cloak and go down to where Boaz lay down and go and cover his feet and lie down bes beside him. And Ruth did what she said. After Boaz discovered her there, he told her to remain for the night so that he would tend, and that he would tend to her situation in the morning. And so she did so. A misreading of the book could lead someone to think that an understanding of divine providence leads to a rather passive acceptance of whatever comes your way and a tendency to interpret other people's guidance as instructions from God that should not be resisted. And guidance of wise people around us should be treated with great respect and often with deference. But the book of Ruth reminds us early on in its very first chapter that respect for divine providence does not mean we should take whatever directions others give us, Ruth's agency is essential to the unfolding story and its message. Ruth refused to take her mother-in-law's instructions on what to do when Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem. While Orpah agreed to go back to Moab and find family there, Ruth adamantly refused to leave her mother-in-law and bound herself to her as a faithful and loyal family member, committed not just to what might have seemed best for herself, but to finding the best for her mother-in-law as well. Ruth chapter 1, verses 15 through 18 is one of the most moving passages in the Bible. After Naomi pleaded with Orpah and Ruth to go back to their families in Moab, and Orpah had finally relented, Naomi says to Ruth, verse 15, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And then when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. None of the rest of the story we read in Ruth would be possible were it not for Ruth's remarkable and brave act of what the Hebrew Bible calls chesed, loyal devotion and kindness that she expressed towards Naomi. In Ruth, we see that the Lord acts, as Bob Hubbard says, the Lord acts in the acts of chesed, and acts of loyal devotion and kindness done by his people. Hesed has to do with mutual obligations between relatives, friends, hosts, guests, master, servant, and others. And in Ruth, we see that the Lord works through loyal acts of his people, which please him because he is sovereignly at work through them. Hubbard 
points out that their teaching of Ruth is simple and straightforward. Whenever people of faith practice God-like chesed, loyal devotion and kindness towards each other, God himself acts in them. In such conduct, his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Ruth and Boaz are held up to us as role models of living by chesed. Through them, we learn the expectations of such a life. These two, Ruth and Boaz, are held up as examples of the extraordinary commitment to which God's chesed calls each one of us. Notice how each one of them in the book is contrasted with someone who's not a bad person, but simply someone who fails to live up to the standard of chesed, the standard of loyal devotion and mercy. The book juxtaposes the two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. It doesn't criticize Orpah when it reports that she returned to Moab in obedience to Naomi's commands. Orpah does the ordinary, the expected. There's nothing wrong with her conduct, conduct except that it is not chesed. By contrast, Ruth represents one who does the extraordinary, the unexpected. She wasn't content to rejoin her Moabite family, remarry and live as her contemporaries might live. Her commitment was to Naomi's people and Naomi's God, even in the afterlife. Even in Bethlehem, she refused to seek a husband to her own advantage, but rather sought a marriage for Naomi's benefit. In such compassionate devotion, she stands out from her peers as one who does chesed, Boaz as well is contrasted over against the unnamed kinsman, redeemer. That kinsman, redeemer, turns out to be average in character, one who gladly passed on his duty to someone else when no economic advantage accrued to him. We don't fault him for his action, for Israelite custom permitted it, but it is not chesed. By contrast, willing to sacrifice his own means, his own life for two poor widows, Boaz far exceeded his fellow and modeled the demands of chesed. Ruth was all in when it came to sticking by Naomi. Boaz was all in when it came to standing up for Ruth and Naomi. God has gone all in in the person of Jesus Christ to redeem you and me from a greater debt and a greater problem than either of those women ever knew. And he sticks by us and he stands up for us and he will see us through to the joyful end of our story as he did with Ruth and Naomi. Those of us living here in the prosperous West need to be extremely careful not to confuse divine providence with positive outcomes. That our ability to have children, to find work, to have food, to find spouses, or to enjoy material things are better signs of providence than the signs of God's grace experienced by those who suffer patiently, those who remain faithful when oppressed, those who demonstrate love when they're persecuted. In fact, those of us who have visited some of the most impoverished parts of the world, the most difficult places on the earth to live, have often noted that Christians in such places are even more ready to identify God's goodness to them and his providence in their lives than those of us who live in places where Christians can go for days without recognizing our dependence on God for every blessing that we experience each and every day. In the book of Ruth, we can recognize tokens of God's faithfulness in the providence of God in Naomi's and Ruth's times of trouble. And it reminds us to be alert to the tokens of the providence of God in our times of trouble, as well as the times when we're prospering. What does and will the providence of God look like in your life and mine? Look around this beautiful chapel. Can you see that great crowd of witnesses up in the cupola? the providence of God was as, as much at work in the lives of those who died young as it was in the lives of those who died old, as much in the lives of those who suffered horribly as it was in the lives of those who experienced prosperity. Can you see the busts of some of the martyrs of the church? They would want you to know 
that God's providence was at work in the circumstances of their lives and their deaths as much as it was in the lives of those who by divine providence escaped persecution and martyrdom. Paul, while writing to the Philippians while in chains, in prison, was able to rejoice in how by God's providence his imprisonment resulted in the spread of the gospel. His earthly life does not have a happy ending by merely human metrics, but is a life marked by a joyful recognition of God's providence and his provision of eternal life and the privilege we have of contributing a verse to the hymn of God's redemptive plan. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Recently, Pastor Charlie Dates of Chicago wrote, be encouraged. Life is unpredictable. Pain is unavoidable. But joy is still available. Paul found that joy even while in chains and facing possible execution. The title I gave for this message is Ruth, Boaz, and the Blessed Offspring of the Marriage Between Providence and Perseverance. The point is that the story isn't just about the provision of a son and a line that would lead to the Messiah, but that Ruth also shows us the providence of God in all the nitty, the gritty details of our earthly lives, and also shows us the importance of chesed, of loyalty and loving kindness to our kin in and beyond Christ. By referring to the blessed offspring of the marriage between providence and perseverance, I have in mind the way that God's providence works through those who persevere in chesed, in loving kindness and loving faithfulness and redemptive grace, even in the midst of grave challenges and the opportunities that God gives to advance his work and exalt his name in the midst of them. Through his providence, God will accomplish his redemptive purposes, and he will do so by accomplishing good even through people whose intentions are evil, as Joseph learned and taught his brothers in Genesis. But Ruth reminds us of the key role of, in God's providence reserved for the acts of godly loyalty and loving kindness. Those who see the needs of their brothers and sisters, whether by family blood or the blood of Christ, and who step up and act in redemptive ways in the name of the Lord. Among other points that Ruth wants us to learn is the truth that the Lord cares as much for all the world's Ruths, all its foreign outcasts and outcast foreigners as Boaz did for Ruth. God actually desires to redeem them and all of us into fellowship with himself. Ruth is another one of those Old Testament texts that prepares the way for the New Testament vision that God is making a people of every tribe and every nation. The term redeemer shows up so often in the book of Ruth that it naturally raises the question, so who ultimately serves the role of the redeemer in this story? Clearly, it isn't the unnamed man who qualified for that role but ref refused to accept it. So is the simple answer just Boaz, the one who redeemed Ruth? Clearly, the ultimate redeemer is the Lord, whose providence worked through the actions of all these people. But an argument can also be made that the Lord used Ruth to bring about the redemption of Naomi and to establish the future of Judah that would lead to the reign of King David and then that other son of David, Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is a redeemer, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our majestic God is here right now. He's closer than your breath. He sees you more fully and loves you more profoundly than you or your loved ones can see or love you. He sees, how your, he sees all of your life in light of all your particular circumstances, and he sees the legacy of every step of faith that you take and of every redemptive act of faith, mercy, love, and grace that you'll ever make. And he is working in, through, and all around you. And he provides tokens of his grace and reminders of his love and gracious plans for our future, even in the hardest of circumstances, if we will but look for them. 
He is glorified when we persevere in faith as we recognize his presence, his comfort, traces and tokens of his grace, even in our hardships. So what is our role today in this redemptive story? Jesus Christ is our redeemer who has shown us chesed, loyal devotion and mercy on the cross and who shows it to us in the blessings and opportunities he provides us each day. And he calls us to a life that recognizes his providential provision and the opportunities to advance his redemptive plan, to demonstrate God's love and mercy, to offer ourselves as instruments of his sacrificial love poured out for others, as Ruth did for Naomi, Boaz did for Ruth, and as Christ has done for all of us. In God's providence, he reaches out to redeem us and to use us as instruments of his redemption in the lives of those around us. Just as Boaz reminded the elders of that city that they were witnesses of all that took place, so we too are witnesses to God's loving faithfulness and to his providence, not only in the lives of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, but also in all mankind through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We are also called to recognize God's faithfulness and providence in our own lives and to live today and each day in light of these truths. Please pray with me. Lord, we are witnesses to your loving faithfulness in our lives. As the witnesses in Bethlehem prayed a blessing over Ruth and Boaz, I pray this blessing that you would make each person here like Ruth and Boaz, who together laid a foundation of chesed, of loving faithfulness. May those gathered here today or listening in be used by your grace to reflect on your faithfulness and to reflect your faithfulness as they persevere in lives of chesed, in lives of loving faithfulness to you and those around them by the power of Christ who lives in us by faith. May the marriage of providence and perseverance and loving faithfulness lead more and more people around us to recognize your love and to worship you for your goodness and grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen.